a general continuity of men. We tend to use angular joints a lot at the city scale. So just in terms of comparing when we're standing up, we thought it was a good one to use. Could be a question. Uh, we filtered out the smallest roads. They don't exist in the data set. So what we have is approximately equal to the A and B roads in the UK. Uh, but at this sort of scale, everything else sort of becomes background anyway. And most of even the B roads, you'll see in a moment, do become background. So that's probably, we think, okay. We've also um, converted the global geodetic coordinates to planar coordinates just by projecting on a flat plane. So some of the angles and so on might be thrown off a little bit. Uh, and we treated both road and rail as a single graph in most of these cases. So we're assuming th uh, free movement between one network and the other, it knows where they connect. But of course, this, especially when we start looking at other types of graphs, uh, road and, and uh, sorry, air and uh, sea and so on, is something that might need to be questioned. So this is the kind of network we're dealing with. In this particular study, all we have access to global data, what we've concentrated on is generally the European map that you can see here. That's the kind of level of resolution of the roads that we take in the A and B roads, and it extends all the way over Eastern and Western Europe. This, just so you can see what it looks like when we start taking the, um, the centrality measures, this is choice at the 50 kilometer region, this 50 kilometer radius. That's the sort of thing that you get. You see these highlighted sort of major centers corresponding with the big cities in Europe. Uh, the major centers, we would say, probably of economic Activity. If we look at the much larger scale, this is the same sort of thing that you see in cities, obviously, at much smaller scales. At the larger scale, of 1,000 kilometers or so, we start to see the major uh, through roads of uh, the major uh, corridors of transportation through Europe. So, what we've done is to take that and then to take a look at that versus the economic data that we have in each country. The idea is that if there's a relationship between the transportation network and the economic activity, uh, then we should be able somehow to see this, we should be able to predict it in, uh, in the data that we have by measurements, ideally at centrality, at the city, the regional and the national level. We only have national level data, so what we've done is essentially to take the GD GDP statistics and uh, see how well those correlate with the centrality measures that we have. Now, on the previous two slides, it looks as though these highlighted regions of high choice appear to correspond fairly well with economic activity. So as an initial hypothesis, what we're saying is that some of the second values uh, in terms of choice measurements at some scale will correspond quite well to the region's gross GDP. That's what we're testing initially. Some? The sums? That's a the number sum. of segments will matter. Uh, well, yes, so I'm getting to that out of the slide. So that, that was the initial thing that we thought. <laughs> and, and yes, you do actually get that. So, um, and I'll show how we correct with that afterwards. So this is this is the initial assumption that we're taking the sum, or we I mean, could equally take the mean and normalize both ways. The R squared um, that we get, particularly the 50 to 100 kilometer regions, is pretty good. It goes up to about 0 0.6, except for um, there are two outliers on this particular set of data that I should mention. We've got Malta, which had a very a disproportionately high GDP, and Czechoslovakia with a disproportionately low GDP. Um, we've not plotted them on these graphs, so particularly because Malta is a completely isolated, with a very, very small set of roads in the middle of the sea. We don't yet have the sea and air routes, so it doesn't really make much sense to include Malta. Czechoslovakia also, the data is from 1992, when it was in the process of dissolution, so it's obviously you're going to be way below that line. Now, as you mentioned, what we're getting here is actually extremely influenced by the number of roads in the country. So just the size of the country is making a huge amount of difference. The background network, whatever it might be, is actually contributing quite a lot to the overall sum of choice. Uh, that and the fact that uh, this is plotted on a long, long scale. When plotted on a linear scale, we get a huge skew in that data. So, but uh, for two reasons, what we decided to do was to normalize it in two different ways to try to, uh, to filter out those problems. So the first thing we did was to take it by country area. Obviously, if we have this case where there's a background network, it's relatively even. Lots of low choice values, but just the sum of all those roads together is uh, potentially affecting the data. So what we've done is to normalize it by country area. So here we've got, this is again a log log, but we're dividing both the... Um, this, this is the GDP, and that's the uh, 
uh, choice value, we're dividing that by country area. So it's the amount of choice within a particular area, particularly good area in the country. And what we get here, also on the log log scale, is um, essentially, uh, again, a peak at around this sort of scale, the intercity scale between 50 and 100 kilometers, but a peak R squared of about 0 0.517. Uh, now that's reasonably good, uh, but in this case also it's still plotted log log, but because the normalization actually helps to better distribute the values, it could also be plotted on a linear scale, in which case the R squared goes up quite a bit. We get 0 0.7 on a linear scale. And again, that's peaking at about the 50 kilometer radius. So it's that radius that I showed at the beginning, a few slides back. If, uh, back. It's that sort of radius rather than that sort of radius that seems to be the best correlation of these levels. Now the other thing we did was, of course, this is, on that map, what we've got is a few of the very high choice bits and then a general kind of background there. What we decided to do as another check was to ignore all the background and just take the top 10% choice as a threshold, and that's that one there. So we've done exactly the same thing. Here now we've got just the top 10%, just those highlighted foreground bits that are showing up as very high choice. And again, the correlations here are pretty awesome GDP at, uh, in this case, much more even. We, the, the, the choice values don't, uh, sort of the, the correlation R squares don't change that much. They all range at all scales between about 0 0.47 and 0 0.58. So it's, um, again, fairly consistent in this case. And it's also peaking at a slightly higher range, around sort of the mid range here, 5,000 to, uh, sorry, 100 to 5,000 kilometers. So it's actually getting to, to the scale of international center to center, that kind of thing. So it's actually picking up some of these major routes between the international centers are potentially playing a fairly important role in terms of uh, giving us this correlation. So in terms of the, the initial hypothesis about the sum of segment values, or the average or some sort of normalization of that, corresponding to gross GDP, yes, it seems to be the case. So we've got no density and choice um, giving us, well, no density and choice, but mainly choice, most importantly, giving us a good indication of economic performance. At this point, we can't definitively infer any kind of causal direction here. Obviously, economic uh, activity expressed in GDP could allow more building of roads and so on, but also the density of routes is a plausible generator for economic activity. If we look at the highest choice levels, though, the top 10%, we actually do get larger scale radii playing a role in the correlation, uh, which suggests there's a good, well, we think it suggests that there's a good, a good chance that because these are large sort of international scale, it's not just an individual country, that there's at least a cycle of feedback. There's something about those networks actually playing a part in the economic activity that we're seeing there. Now that's just in terms of gross GDP. The other thing we looked at was GDP per capita. So how does the, potentially, if there's a causal relation here, how does the opportunity of access to whatever these networks might be, how does that allow each person with respect to their own position within it to, to maximize their own sort of economic performance? So it's GDP per capita that we're looking at in this case. When we look at the correlations that we're comparing to the ones before, we get actually something that's, you know, it's reasonable, but it's not great. We only get a 0 0.3 to 0 0.36 correlation when we're looking at GDP per capita to the, um, to the choice values. But what we did see is that when we look at that plot, and you'll see it in a second, there are distinct clusters. And the distinct clusters seem to correspond to the difference between Eastern and Western Europe. So one plausible hypothesis that we probably look at in more detail is that whether there's a division, don't forget all this data is 1992. So if the division actually between the Western European countries and the former communist countries, recently former communist countries, might have some sort of a, a role to play. Would we see a different sort of pattern in those individual groups? And it looks like there is a difference between the individual groups. In particular, if we look at, this is Western Europe here, this is Eastern Europe down here. If we look at the correlations for Western Europe, we see that it is in fact quite high, it's similar to the ones we had before. So GDP per capita in Western Europe, we get 0 0.6, 0 0.61 especially toward these sort of larger scales, the international routes between countries. Um, however, in Eastern Europe, we don't find that at all. The correlation is almost nothing with the choice values of the road network. So if there is a causal relationship here, it's plausible to suggest we think that Western Europe 
particularly the, the less controlled market economies, might be able to take advantage of the opportunities that those transportation networks are giving and allowing this strong correlation in their values against choice to uh, economic activity, whereas the Eastern European countries have not been able to do that for whatever reason. Now, it's plausible, and there's by no means any kind of theory yet to base this on, but it's plausible if you take the example of, say, natural movement in, within a city. The idea of natural movement is that pedestrians, the movement of pedestrians uh, through the street grid as determined by the street grid, discounting any other factors. The case that on one side of the country there are potentially an absence of factors that would restrict this kind of economic activity, whereas on the other countries there are potentially factors, political factors and so on, that might restrict, that might play more of a role in terms of the economic activity, might suggest that there's some kind of idea of a natural movement that affects the economies of countries. And that's what we're proposing here, although there is more work to be done. Um, and although, with the caveats, of course, that this economic activity is not the same as pedestrian activity. First of all, as I said before, movement is based on all sorts of other things that are not visual. Um, and, of course, we only observe gross domestic product at the level of country. So there are differences and more things remain to be seen in terms of development theory. But the evidence suggests that at least some kind of ordering of the network may be influencing the, uh, the international behavior that we're seeing. So in conclusions, uh, we're suggesting that there's some kind of, based on these results, there is some feasibility of a global scale analysis, and that some phenomena that we see at the smaller level of space syntax do seem to apply at these much larger scales. We've used GDP as an indicator of the general state of economy, and we find that it did correlate with uh, both the, with the total segments and with high choice, particularly at uh, those levels, between 50 and 500 kilometers. It suggests, we think, that there's at least some feedback at the regional level. GDP per capita, though, uh, very interesting, we think. Uh, this is, again, potential for each person, I guess, to maximize their output. But the fact that there is a difference between Eastern and Western Europe seems to suggest that there's some kind of interesting phenomenon here that remains to be seen and deserves to be investigated a little bit more. Just to finish, um, in terms of future work, where this is going, and potentially how it also uh, impacts other kinds of economic analysis, related to the unfolding project, we are looking at different types of economic activity, particularly with respect to input-output models. Now, input-output models, you can see them here, schematically represented for Spain and China, have each sector of the economy and the flow, essentially, of US dollars from one sector to another sector expressed as a graph within the country, but also the data shows country to country. So it again is a big network, much denser network than the kind that we have, but it's a network that can and has been analyzed by similar sorts of centrality analysis. So the idea is that if we can actually couple these things together and find a way of understanding the flows, both spatially and economically, that we will be able to tackle questions that have uh, important uh, implications in terms of uh, international relations and policy and things like that. So that's where we're going with it. And uh, that's the end. Thank you. Can, can you go back to the slide of the GDP per capita? That one? Yeah. yeah. That bottom right hand one. Which axis is which? So this is uh, GDP is always, in all of these slides, oh, the purple axis. Okay. And uh, choice values are. So, so you've got three lots there. You've got East Europe. What's the middle lot on, on the line? Well, that's the, Eastern Europe. Yeah, what's the middle um, lot and what's the upper lot? All of these are, I mean, we, we made the division because we were specifically looking at Eastern and Western Europe. So all of these are the Western European countries. <coughs> you're, you're talking about I'm talking about the, you've got an upper oh, you're this. Oh, well, no, 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 no. Okay, what's the right hand one? That is... Uh, USA. A bit blurry, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm? But we didn't have USA, I think. Uh, yeah, sorry, what? Uh, Germany. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, it could be. It could be Germany. It's difficult to read. Yeah. So, so what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the thing with Switzerland, UK? What are, what's that group down with that? If you went to. This group? No, this, this group. The one above. The one above. The other one. The whole group. Yeah. Which, Which is sort of a regression line. Take a regression line. Yeah. 
Oh, oh, the, above versus below. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, we've got. Well, that I can see. That's Finland. That's Luxembourg. I think that's Switzerland. We did discuss uh, below and above the line for a little bit, but we didn't actually okay. pursue so, it. So these are the ones where area matters. Luxembourg, Switzerland, small populations, very large financial services sector, high GDP. Yeah. Okay. But there, there isn't, I mean, at this level anyway, it might be more where the correlations are less. At this sort of level, Certainly, there is a distance from the line, but there's not a huge distance from the line. So they, 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 they seem to form two distinct lines. They are two distinct lines. It's, it's the ones which are size related. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I think if you have, let's say, if you make such a distinction, uh, uh, you divide it through area. If you have very small areas, then you do statistical analysis. They Ah, so here it's, here it's not, much in a here it's not by area. Here so it's not by area. This is by per capita. When, when we look at it by uh, area, yeah, uh, not, that, was, that was by area. And, and it's not, I mean, it, there's still probably. Uh, if we look by area, actually, I don't, I mean, we've got, we've got Scandinavian countries above the line. They have big areas, though. Um, we've got. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. There's so, so, so I'll, 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 see I'll, I'll go for the GDP per capita, yeah. but yeah. also control for country area or population uh, size. So the choice is also well, the GDP per capita yeah. yeah. is population size. No, no, you've got to control the number of population size. Oh, okay. Okay. So cluster them yeah. in that way. So it's population square. Mm. Uh, that, that is per capita. This is per capita. Yeah. Um, how did you calculate the choice values? Just uh, counting or summing, uh, summing or averaging? Yeah, this, this is the, the, the borders of the country. This like, is the sum. sum border. Border. Either, either one of my co-authors can correct me if I'm wrong. And this particular case, I believe this was this was sum uh, or or mean. No, this is mean. This was mean choice at the various radius uh, versus GDP per capita. Yeah, within the borders, like the polygon of the Yeah, yeah, so you take the polygon of the country okay. and, and you take all the segments within it and you take the mean choice of all those segments. I think this is very interesting. The only thing is really uh, causality is quite different. It's difficult to assess because, like, if you have a, a poor country, for sure it's brought by poor who is quite. Yeah. Right? Because they don't have money to do jobs. Yeah. And so this is kind of. It's, yeah, that, that's exactly why I, I want to stress that we can't say anything happy. about causality. And that's why the interesting things we thought were the, were the points at which you actually get the, the correlations in the, in the larger radii, because those are picking up international routes mm -hmm. rather than just things that might happen in a particular city within the board boundaries of one country. I think there's a couple of other things that you have to, I understand why you've had to filter out the small road segments. And that's because the mapping conventions across the different countries are different. Yeah, um, I think they are essential to have the small segments in there because development density is going to be a crucial component in this. Yeah. And if you eliminate all the small segments, you're actually losing one of the prime determinants of, of what's going to make an economy work, I think. Well, the, the difficult thing there is, I mean, particularly when we get into the one where, I mean, maybe this is the wrong thing to do, but when we take, say, the top 10% of choice, mm. all the small segments will... I could be wrong, but certainly at the scales that we're looking at, 50 kilometer radius and up, none of the small segments will appear as anywhere near the top 10% of choice. No, that's fine, but the existence of the small segments makes a difference to the calculation of the big segments. Yeah. Oh, so oh, there's a yes, density, yes, yes, there's yes, a density yes, of development right. issue. Yeah. We've got right. lots of building blocks. Right. Because there's lots of buildings yeah. and therefore, yeah. yeah. Now, I think if I eliminate the that you've only ended up with a sort of large scale road network. Yeah. You're actually eliminating a major way of representing development of the economy, if you yeah. like. Second issue is that I think you need probably to start splitting the GDP into GDP by different sectors. Mm -hmm. So if you would take manufacturing sectors separately to essentially knowledge based sectors, yeah. I think. The real interesting question from a syntax point of view is whether it is um, accessibility gives rise to innovation, which would probably have a greater effect on the knowledge-based sectors yes. rather than necessarily perhaps on manufacturing. 
manufacturing may be more to do with logistics and flow of resources. Um, and you might have a different kind of correlation there. So it'd be quite interesting to take them sector by sector. That, that was, that was the, one of the primary ideas behind the input output divisions that we have. And, and especially given the, the different the road, uh, road, rail, and, and sea networks that we might have. Because yeah. as well as, as the knowledge base versus, say, goods and so on, you do have different modes of transportation for different sectors of the economy. So by isolating that and seeing how the correlation change against the different types of network as well, we would hope to see something much more interesting in terms of finer scale analysis. Um, Sean, a fascinating stuff. Uh, I just had a, a question with regard to the modeling, uh, the way you're using the angular choice, mm -hmm. and whether that relates to Alex's comment about how some of these roads are automated. Just mm -hmm. because this, would you, would you probably consider having state connections between major, major intersections where the way, let's say, a highway between uh, Curling to Dort Dortmund goes, it's just a link. It's not important whether it, it uh, deviates and uh, what the angular choice does with that one. Yes, potentially. I mean, that, that would be one of the difficulties in I know, networks, networks, particularly the, the sea well, and air networks, is actually that you, you really don't, you don't have anything between your origin and destination. Correct, correct. And, and that would be because much if, more if you, you were able work, to but, somehow find a way to transfer this data into that. Then that, that automatically would take care of how these some of the smaller roads or those in mountainous regions are deviated along. But but it is the opposite of what Alan said, as I understand it. So yes. that, that would that would eliminate even more of the important small no, details. No, but not, uh, it might, but it would not necessarily eliminate the same set, especially some of those that uh, let's say would, would curve a lot, uh, where angular choice. <coughs> ah, okay. No, I mean the, the point about angular choice, I, I do admit that that is a very very I don't think it is actually. I think it's exactly. This is uh, Lars's presentation earlier today, um, where he made the distinction between the geographer's view of the world, where they always think about the nodes, if you like, being the intersection, the architect's view, where we think about the space being the node. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the point about um, the angular measure on the segment is it. Re it returns you back to the axial line. It returns you yeah. back to the space. Yeah. And I think there's a fundamental error in thinking about nodes as um, the virtual entity being turned into the node, the the link being just a, a weight on something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's actually needs to be the reverse because what this is all about in economic terms must be the byproduct of that. Yeah. So it's the fact that the road goes past you, which is the advantage. Yeah, the fact that the aeroplane flies over means that it's unlinked and it's of no advantage to anybody underneath the flight path. Yeah. Yeah? And the same with the railway, because there's no station. Yeah. But the road gives you access directly off onto the land parcel, yeah. in principle at least. And so that's, where the, that's the economic reality. Yes, it isn't to do with transport engineers' nodes, it's to do with axial lines. Yeah. That's why they're the primal and representation. Okay. What's the relation to that? I'm sure we've read it, but, but uh, Alistair wrote something about this in, to, to this couple of conference discussing whether on, on, on a, I think it was a UK level or something, or uh, at least the, 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 the Scotland and England island, mm -hmm. uh, discussing whether it actually could be used as an approximate as, as a, of an extra line mm -hmm. and so on. It's a very fascinating discussion and I think very informative. Uh, and and on, on act from a certain scale and upwards, it can almost be assumed to do to do that. I think that's basically his conclusion. Yeah. But then, when you start going look more locally, it might actually not work. Yeah. Uh, so so I'm not, I, I wouldn't be so worried about that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I said it, 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 it's an assumption we've made. We weren't entirely uh, against it, but it, it's something that we've been investigating. I have another basic question. I, I wonder what was the what was the thing you wanted to model? What sort of behavior you wanted to model in, in this model? I mean, it, if it's a behavior of people you know, in moving from one country to another country, the question is, uh, I mean, the, the thing is that, for instance, if I'm in Netherlands, I'm going to go to Germany, I will take a train. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't consider all those road networks at all. Yeah. So if it's that behavior, I, <coughs> That would be a question. What is that behavior that you're trying to I th I think it mimic was a, with your model? 
It, it, it was the, it was the kind of combined thing. effect of many different types of behavior. So that, that's why we didn't make the distinction between road and rail in this particular case. But, but as, as I mentioned in response to Alan's question about the different uh, sectors of the economy, at, at a finer level, whether it's a finer, probably not a finer scale level, but a finer level of aggregation of data, if we can pick apart, say, different sectors of economies and take a look at different types of transportation that might be more relevant to those, then we'd start actually differentiating those. We just haven't done it yet. Now, it's just gross GDP because that's all the data we have. I, I, just to relish, I, I, I would suggest um, not doing that. Uh, I think uh, one of the things about modeling space in this way is that even though it contains information about behavior, it's not locked down to a single behavior, like you have to do with, for instance, traffic analysis, make a lot of assumptions. I would rather suggest that you remove the statement that this is about goal-oriented long-distance travel and just say this is the way space operates yeah. and all the different kinds of emergent patterns of behavior that contributes to GDP might, uh, might correlate, might be the thing that drives in this yeah. direction or not. So that seems to me to be a more fruitful endeavor to start with. And then if you find a correlation, you can start to look at the emergent, emergent properties that lie underneath that. But I would not assume that it's necessarily people going from one town to another that they oh, no. Do. No, 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 you're absolutely right. No, but it's, I mean, it is exactly that. It's always, and it's always going to be aggregate behavior. But even if we do pick it apart by sector, it will still be aggregate behavior. If we find a, a different kind of aggregation at a finer level that we do see correlations in, for instance, this, this yeah, yeah, yeah. difference between Eastern and Western Europe, which we weren't looking for but seemed to be obvious, it's worth, it's worth pursuing that in, in more detail to see what lies behind it. Um, just a suggestion, another body of data that you can look at is um, bodies of data from the European community on subsidised transport systems. So one of the things that you'll see is that in Spain the road network is much faster than it is in France or Germany, um, or the lowlands. And yet in Spain there have been massive investments in road infrastructure over the last 20 years. Um, and that's because of regional development funding. Yeah. So actually just seeing where the regional development funding has gone would be an interesting thing to yeah. see, and then what effects it's had. Yes. Because it sort of might lead back to the previous uh, talk with these developments that have taken place over years in, in Iran Porto. Yeah. Well, actually, how much of that is made possible by the regional development funding putting in the major road accessibility that then makes possible smaller economic developments? And that's really where GDP will be will be created is in the production of those small developments. Yeah, that's that's, that's a really helpful suggestion. I won't get into why right now, but yeah. I'm, I'm probably mm -hmm. out of time. Uh, two, two really quick things. Yeah. One is, uh, your, I completely accept that you don't want to go down the causal route, uh, and I think that's very wise of you. But I couldn't help coming to mind thinking how many times road building um, programs we put in place in order to raise economic performance. So you should have to Robert Moses in New York or Germany in the interwar period where road building was definitely seen as a precursor to promoting economic development. And I wonder, and I was wondering how you could test this out. And clearly, what, you know, if you could do this as a longitudinal study over time and see whether, you know, first of all, investment in road infrastructure further down the line resulted in you know, something ma managing to move up the pace on their GDP. Yeah. Now, I don't know whether you still want to be looking at this for the next 30, 40 years. Is there any way that you can go back and find some historical data on GDP? You know, probably not for the whole region, yeah. but just as a subset. We can. So that yeah. was one thing. Second thing, I think you mentioned very briefly about pedestrian movement or vehicle movement correlations. I don't know how many lines you have in Europe, but if you could do a random sampling, and you found some completely mug of a researcher who could go onto Google Maps and count the number of pedestrians and cars on the route for subsample, you could get that correlation. Yep. It would just be a lot of drug work. Yep. <laughs> well, you do mechanical search. Yes. Anyway, mechanical search, precisely. So you, you come up with a random, random sampling, and then using mechanical search, you just subcontract out various bits, yep. get them to do the people and the car counting in Google. Yeah, one thousand. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.